started. As I said, this is Rich Basil, and I'm with Simtrax. And a um, couple things that we should know in the beginning, we're going to focus on Star Query uh, and use that as a lens for the topic, access versus security versus compliance. Um, not original, but it's been called by many people the data dilemma. How do you balance these forces? Uh, just for those people um, out there, I want to make sure you understand, this is not going to be a deep dive into the StarQuery product. Um, to cover the functionality of that would take much more time than we, we have today, but I'd be happy to go through in detail with anybody who wants to at some point in time, just let me know. We'll have contact info available at the end. Uh, I want to be able to tailor it to have it fit your needs. So having said all that, we're going to focus on and use StarQuery as a lens, again, access, security, and compliance. And now that I've said what we're not going to be doing, let's take a look at what we are going to be doing. Um, the agenda today, it's going to be, as it says, discussions and demos. Uh, we're going to bounce back and forth a couple slides, go to do some live stuff to illustrate what we do in StarQuery to illustrate those points, and then back to some slides again and back and forth. Again, please put your questions down, put them in that tab, and we will definitely get to them towards the end. Um, we're going to start focusing on the data strategy and playing offense and defense and put a bookmark there. We'll get back into that and I'll explain that a little bit more. And then we're going to start looking at the challenges of a data strategy, making the information accessible to business users. Let's face it, that's why we have the information. But we we'll also have to ensure that this information is secure. And added into the mix are the various regulatory requirements uh, that you know, whether they're industry-based or general across the board, that you have to satisfy as well. And interestingly enough, you know, the compliance requirements tend to be a kind of a combination of accessibility and security, but more important, tracking all of that. Then we're going to get one slide, I promise, just one slide about SimTracks for those folks who aren't familiar with us just so we know what they are. But I, I purposely put it at the end. Um, more often than not, people put that at the beginning. I figure if you're round, around to the end, then you want to know who we are. If you're not, you probably don't care. So having said that, let, let's get going. Um, let's go back to playing offense and defense. Um, it's often said in football and other sports too, I would imagine, that defense wins championships. Well, the truth is it's more of a balance and a balancing act between offense and defense that wins championships. But that's also true of a data strategy. Came across a great article that I strongly recommend um, Leonardo uh, Delamule and Thomas Davenport. Leonardo is the Chief Data Officer for AIG. Thomas is a professor here locally. I'm in the Boston area at Babson College. And they kind of broke it down. I think this chart kind of captures some of the key objectives um, of both defense and offense, if you will, security and access, and how you have to balance the two, and where the two come in, and what their focus is. Um, I love the idea of a single source of truth versus multiple versions of the truth. And I think that's one of the things that we look at separating data, which has to have a single source of truth, and information. Information is a matter of perspective, and we have to have our business users able to grab information and grab different parts of the information, different parts of the data to build a more complete picture. That's what we want to try to do. We want to pull that together. Now, how you balance offense and defense depends on your organization, depends on your industry. Obviously, there's some highly regulated industries, healthcare comes to mind, financial, amongst others, where the defense becomes more of an issue. Offense may become more of an issue in some respects, um, and for example, a retail organization. Uh, but they both parts are key and critical. Where you do that sliding scale is very important. What we like to think about at Simtrax is to provide you a tool that allows you to set that scale where you need it to set for your organization. Um, one of the things that did come out in the, that article that was in the uh, Harvard Business Review, and again, anybody who wants to get a copy or at least get the link to that article, please email me and that information will be at the end. I can get that for you. Just quickly, I'm certainly not going to read it. It becomes an eye test, but it did have a really nice if you will, check, pilot's checklist that might be a good, useful way to start discussions within your organization and understanding where your priorities lie. So building a data strategy, building a data strategy that has the right amount of offense and the right amount of defense, and hopefully we can provide the tools that will help you get to the strategy that meets your needs. 
So let's talk about offense, or at least data access for business users. Uh, those in the manufacturing world, I'm sure, will recognize the word name Demi, and the Demi Award is one of the, the key manufacturing awards. And I like the idea of data is, without data, a person, it's just another person with an opinion. Um, you want your business users to make their decisions that are based on data, because it isn't just their decisions, it's your company. So of those of you in IT who are keepers of the data, you want to make sure that it's, it's available and accessible to the people who have to make their decisions. But it's not just accessibility, it's the speed with which you can get a hold of that data. Uh, we at Simtrex are an SAP partner, which means we get to work with their user groups. And one of the folks in the user groups put out a survey, and it showed taking a look at self-service versus IT-centric BI, and just about 60% of the respondents felt they were faster insights. They were getting to the information they needed quicker with self-service BI. Uh, harking back to the HBR article, uh, they came up with an interesting fact that 80% that of an analyst's time is spent simply discovering and preparing the data. The ability to get to that data quicker, the ability to get to more of that data within a time frame makes for better decisions, and certainly that's the goal of everybody. Uh, but there are certain requirements for self-service to make it truly self-service, and I think this is where we shine. Uh, back in my misspent youth, I spent some time working with some artificial intelligence people, and one of the axioms in artificial intelligence was you could only teach someone something they almost already know. And what does that mean in this context? It means you want your business users to have to be able to use skills that they already have. Drag and drop using use is critical. And you also want them to be working within formats that they already use, whether it's Excel or dashboards. Again, make it as comfortable and familiar as possible because that's how you're gonna get them to use it. And that brings us to our first demo. So let's fall out of here and go to our our demo, and this is live with our star query maps and dashboards. And as you can see, we basically start with Excel. All your users are familiar with it, but in this case, you'll notice this last tab is a Simtrax tab. We're an add-on into Excel when you load us on with our star query for Excel, and we can simply click on it to get to what we need to do. And certainly, timely, reports are critical, ease of getting to those reports are critical. Certainly we can set up reports that are scheduled. Um, that's one way they can access the information from, through Star Query. We have a scheduler, every morning you know, at six o'clock, a report is run and delivered to them so they could have it. They could also start doing some ad hoc work. They can go to recent queries. They can sit there and say, what have I looked at before? Let me do it when I wanna do it. Or, and I think one of the real keys, is they can build their own query. They don't have to know query language. They can just use drag and drop skills to build very, very sophisticated queries. Now here's where we go through the magic of demos. I took a little time and set some things up uh, to make it a little bit easier. Normally, we would have gone back to that Excel spreadsheet and hit the Star Query for Excel button that you can see right here. But you folks don't need to see, watch me browse through uh, various uh, trees of data to find the right folder to get to the star query. So ours is buried pretty much because I'm on the virtual desktop at this point. So I just took it right over there and built and showed one of the ways your map, your star query would look to start pulling out and doing the query. Here are a bunch of things. They're in plain English because that's the way it was built. This is built from a map and we'll get to what those maps are and what they mean and they, when we get to the security side. But it's as simple as this. I want to, I'm a business user and since I'm a salesperson, I want to know what's happening with, with, with an account. I also want to know which salesperson is running that account. What's the estimated value of the next project? And what's the probability of a closing? Now I could just run it like that but I also have the option of putting constraints. Again, very simple, a plus sign, I wanna add one. I can take a look at a constraint and I look for, I wanna look at the opportunity base and I wanna look at probability of close. 
Now, I don't care if, it, if you see the things in my report that are a 10% chance or even a 20% chance of close. So I want to take a look at those probabilities that are greater than and equal to, and I could type in a, a value here, or I can go to my eyedropper and pick one of the values from the chart. In this case, we'll pick 70%. And I'll click OK. And now, just because I may not be the only one to ever use this report, I'll have I'll be able to change the name so it's something that's in plain English that people can be very comfortable. Uh, and you can see why I decided to do a lot of typing in advance because I can't talk and type at the same time. But we're all set. And now I just hit OK. And now what I've got is a constraint on all these. And now I just hit Run. I hit my table, you see it runs, and now I've got the account name, the salesperson, the estimated value, and the probability of close. Simple as that. Now that report I can save, and I could use it as one of my, my recently used reports. I can ask that it be scheduled and set up a schedule so I get this report every Monday morning, whatever makes sense for them, but it's just that simple. Um, I had one of our technical people even comment that it's so simple they were able to teach a salesperson, meaning me, to do it. So I think that, that, that that's a strong recommendation right there. But that's on the Excel side. We also have the ability to do dashboards. Again, I did a little setup work on this dashboard, uh, put in the same constraint, but you can see it's done exactly the same way. And now I want to do something graphics. Uh, I want to have a graphical representation. And I want to do some things, you know, there's the theory that the higher up you are in the org chart, uh, the less detail you should be looking at. So let's do some graphics. Let's pick a chart for the first one and say, what type of chart? Okay, let's, let's do a funnel chart and just look at estimated value. Oh, I'm going to have to clear this away a little bit. Hold on and make this estimated value. And I want to do this by salesperson. Drag and drop. And now I will just call this funnel, but again, you can name it anything you want. But that's the first part of my dashboard. Now I want to do another one. And maybe let's do a pivot table this time. And we're going to do account name salesperson, the actual value of the account, and that should be enough for right now. And that will be, we'll just call that chart. Yes, I'm not original with my naming convention. And now by just saving all this, as it is, oh, let's see here, my resources, and we'll call it Web dash two. Again, the original naming convention that I always bring to the world. And we can save it. And now by simply going, and I will, may have to log back in because that's part of the issues here, and go to my dashboards and my resources. And we will have. I did have to re-log re in. One of the uh, security issues here is the fact that it does time out, and I've been do talking much too much. And we'll hit Web Dash 2. We'll open it up. We'll just slide this over, and you can see the funnel charts appearing, as well as, as well as the pivot table. And now we'll just save it all. And let's change this into, put it in my resources, because that's where I like to hide things. Okay. And now we've got 
our dashboards, but we also have filters. I can filter by company, and I can filter by salesperson. Let's see what Jack and Dan and Fernando have. And you can see a quick change. People have the ability. Let's just look at, well, I'm not going to pick one, one of those many customers, but you get the idea. All we're basically doing is putting together a dashboard that can be sized and viewed at any point in time, and now we're all set to go. We can put hover over it, and it's a great executive tool. Again, it's access, it's ease, and it's the ability to get there. So having said that, let's go back and talk about the other side of the coin. Let's talk about what IT is looking at and saying, and I love this graphic. Yes, you have to ensure the data is secure as well. Let's not put the cart before the horse. Having access is wonderful, but security is just important. So what are we doing in terms of security? When you look at security, you look at a number of different things that have to happen. First of all, we have to have limits on the data and be able to put constraints in the data that people can access. Second, we have to look at the permissions. Who are the people that are going to access it? How are we going to set up specific permissions for those folks so it fits their role, fits their need, but doesn't go beyond it? I mentioned uh, the statistic that 80% of an analyst's time is spent finding and organizing the data. That article also had another great statistic that says 70% of the employees have access to data they shouldn't use. And you also want to have a very secure management console. So having said that, we'll back out of here again, and it's back to the demo. Now, this, we talked about the maps, and this will show you how, how to build a map and this is usually, although we do have power users in the business communities that build their own maps, they do have the permissions, this is usually something that IT does. And this is your way to secure the data. So while the end user has access, they have access only to the data that they have permission to see, and you get to be very selective about it. So let me go through very quickly how that's done. We're going to define a data source. We have a connection wizard here. Um, we're going to look the databases, as you can see, everything from DB2, any sort of SQL database. You also saw that we had options even going to flat files as well. So what are, these happen to be the databases that we have available to us. So we can go to virtually any relational database at all. Now we're going to have to pick out the database. And you can see where our numbers come from, just a second. And it was 2011 was our... Um, CRM database. Now we have options here. In this case, I want to use my Windows login, but you could also put a specific login. Again, for security purposes, if you want to have a specific login for your people just to get to that, that you can do that as well, or you can have it connected to your Windows login. Now let's pick the database, and let's test the connection. The connection has worked. Okay, we're good to go. And now that's just one data source. What if I had multiple data sources I wanted to hit? Again, just hit the plus side again and run through the entire process, and you can add multiple data sources. So now we have one data source. Now the next thing is let's build a table. Let's take a look at the, those data elements, and let's build a table. So we're going to add a table here. Uh, we have to know the schema, but that's something that I'm sure, which is part of the reason we put this in IT's hands. And let's take a search. Here are all the tables in that schema, but we're going to take a limit. We're not going to show everything to the people. You know, who They only need access to certain amounts. They need any access to the account base. That makes sense. And let's scroll down and say, how else are we going to limit them? What else do they need to see? Well, they want to see about the opportunities. They'd asked about opportunities, so we'll add that to the group. And then we'll, we'll need to know who the owners are. So we'll add that. Now, we've taken that whole database, and we've picked three areas that these people are going to be able to take a look at. Let's organize it so you can see it. And it even has an automatic join function. So now you've been able to join it. Particularly when you're using multiple databases, you may want to add joins, and you can do that manually as well. So now what we've done is taken the entire database and broke it down into you know just a few small number of fields that we're going to then expose to those people who want to build those queries. And now we can get even more refined with that. 
Let's take a look at the account base. Well, one of the things we're going to need is the name of the account. But name is not necessarily totally relevant when you see that there are names for everything. So let's make sure that we are putting it in a words that our users will understand. So let's call it an account name. Very simply done. Now let's see what else we want. We want the opportunity base. Well, again, the word name comes up again, and if we had all those things just calling them name, that could be confusing. So let's talk about it and call it a project. And again, whatever works for you folks, for what your group, that's all you need to do. And let's take a look. Well, we had probability of close. We want the actual value. We may want the estimated value. And uh, let's see what else. Actual close date. That's always a good thing to have. And we start to build the things that we are giving them permission to see and they've asked to see. And then the third thing that we used in our example was the owner base. So we can look at this and say, okay, again, name comes up. Why don't we call it salesperson? Now you're all set, but you know, you're not quite sure you want to give them access to everything. Even within this small set of things, there are things you may want to eliminate. So let's take a look and we can look and by looking at the dimensions, we see everything in that's in the, in the, in that environment. So we're going to say, okay, these are all the names. Well, we'll pick on Adam because actually I know Adam's out today. Uh, so we can do that. And I want to say, I want to put a constraint up and I want to look at the owner base and I want to look at name and I want to say not equal to, and again, let's get out that, that easy eyedropper, not equal to Adam. So I hit OK, I hit OK, and now I've got a constraint set up. Now all I have to do is put that constraint in the owner box. Now this constraint could be any one of these areas, anything that you need to have blocked off. It could be dates, it could be certain numbers, for example, a social security number. But now if I look at the data dimensions, you'll see that he's not ex exactly available anymore. So these are the kinds of things you want to do in terms of restricting the data. But again, that's part of the puzzle. The other part from a consumer perspective is how do we, can, how do we protect the data and the users? How do we make sure that we're looking at the right people and the right people are looking at the right information? So let's take a look at our users. As an administrator, which is what I'm signed in as, I get a whole list of the users. Now certainly where it says user type, we can say the AD means their Active Directory. So we've gotten their information from Active Directory and we've transferred some of the permissions that they have from Active Directory. But we can get even more granular. They're approved, but are they administrator? Are they approved for dashboards? Are they approved to design dashboards? What domain are they going to be coming out of? It, are they involved in a group? You can, set to, you can set up user groups as well. So simply by taking and defining a group and adding users, taking users out. There's Lizzie. I'm sorry, Lizzie, you're no longer going to be part of this group. And we'll get rid of her. And she's gone. So you could manage both the groups and the users and the user permissions right within here. Now let me do this first. Now I've I've logged in as an administrator and that's my role, but I can log out and then log back in as demo user. Demo user has a different set of permissions and we'll see what it looks like inside from, now if you notice all the administrative functions are gone, all the others, I get to see the public folders in my resources. I'm able to, in this case, view dashboards, but I'm not able to create them. So this is a great way to have it set up so people who are designed to view things but not touch the data can still be part of the program, can still take the benefits and get the information, but they're not responsible for creating or managing any of the information. So having said that, let's log out again and log back in as me because I will have to get back there. So what we've shown is that from an IT perspective, 
you have total control on what data, what information is available to the users. And you also have full control in terms of what the users, what the users can see, who they can, they are, what permissions they have, both from Active Directory, and it also allows you to take people from outside the area. And we'll log in, and we'll do one more thing. Um, in terms of the users, we are able to take a look and, and say, do we need to be able to allow people from the outside? As you looked, user groups, there are people who are totally outside the area. Um, Gary was not in, within the company. The CEO is in the company, but he's coming from outside the area. The NA, he's in our French group. He's not part of our, our, our little community, so he's going to be coming from the outside as well. So it allows us to take a look at how we get people to access it. So security, access, then it comes to compliance. Um, this cartoon is probably a lot funnier for those of us on the outside, but for some people, this totally lacks humor because there are people who are being at least um, fined, if not fully prosecuted, because they weren't in compliance. Compliance, as I said, it takes aspects of security as well as aspects of assets. But one of the things that you have to keep in mind, what a lot of compliance is, is the ability to document it, to have that existing audit trail. And that's so critical. Sarbanes-Oxley, we do meet the requirements in terms of the data requirements. Just a quick rundown again, from a repository or reporting, a security and a systems control point of view, we do fully meet Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. Um, you take your time and read those. It's also up on our website. We have a special section in our SOX compliance. Uh, but for those of you who are in industries that have their own set, whether it's health care, whether it's financial, um, whether it's securities, no matter where you are, we have the checklist. We can help you out, and we can make your processes compliant. So let's go back to the demo one more time, as we're getting close to the time we need to, need to and just take a look at some of the things we can do. Um, again, compliance in many respects is the ability to document it. So as an administrator, I can go in and say, who's used these files? We get a very good view at a high level on what's happened well with all these files. Who's used them, who's opened them, where they've opened them from. But we may want to drill down even deeper. So a right click of the mouse in history, and we get all the information on that particular file. Kirk has been very active, as you can see. And we have all his, all his access to that particular file. It's true there. It's true in all of them. View history, and we get a good snapshot and certainly a good day, date, time when they were accessed and who they were accessed by. But the phrase you hear very frequently is, who knew what when? So now we know what they could have known, but we have to know who. And now we look at our user data. It should be coming up any second. And oh, let's pick on Kirk um, because he was here. So let's take a look at what Kirk has been doing. He's been a very active person. If you notice, he's had almost 300 logins. And now we get every single login that Kirk's had. Is he logged in now? When did he log in? Where did he log in from? whether it was from the web, from the dashboard, wherever he's been. So now we've been able to say, we have a definite audit trail. What files were looked at, when, and by whom. And that's a lot of, a lot of the issues that surround compliance and also the security to prove to them that nobody could have accessed that didn't have or shouldn't have permission. So, We'll go once more back to the slides, and we're just about out of time, but let me just get here quickly and go one more slide. I promised you a little bit about Simtrax. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are a global company, uh, U.S. offices in L.A. and in Boston, where I am. Uh, we also have offices in London, Nimes, where our management team resides, and Waldorf, if you hear me mention we are an SAP partner, as you see it down there. 
so Waldorf office is really important, as well as an office in Mumbai with data centers in LA, Neems, and in Mumbai. And we are uh, an SAP, an IBM, and a Microsoft certified partner. We've been talking primarily about our business intelligence tool. We also have a document output management tool called Compleo. Love to have a chance to chat with you folks about that, particularly focused on the AS400 slash I-Series, as well as a number of the ERP systems, particularly, as I said, SAP, but also a number of the other uh, systems to get the documents out of the data. Over 4,000 customers worldwide. So having said that, well, let's go back and get you in conclusion. What do we deliver with Star Query? We get the information to the business users in a way they can access it in a form and format they're familiar. We demonstrate data security. We can show you how you can identify who's going into it, how they're going into it, and what permissions they have, both through Active Directory and our very granular tools themselves. And we also allow you to put constraints and permissions on the data itself, what can be looked at, how they can focus on it, as well as the re regulatory compliance, uh, certainly with SOX, but also meeting a number of the industry uh, compliance issues, HIPAA, PCI, et cetera. So having said that, I'm going to open it up and see if there are any questions from you folks. Um, and let's just check here. <clears throat> 